Hello everyone, this is Mark Van de Wettering of the Brain Wagon blog. Today I read an interesting post by um, Scott Harden, uh, who was working on generating um, an interesting mode called Hellschreiber, which is an old German uh, sort of teleprinter code that works much like a fax engine, using an Atmel uh, AVR, I think 48, and a simple canned oscillator. The idea actually had never really occurred to me, and what also had never occurred to me was that I could potentially use um, the setup that I had already done for my laser transmitter to do the same thing. So this is exactly the same code that I used in my laser transmitter set test that's supposed to be repeating the words brain wagon over and over again, except instead of these wires which used to go to a laser, they now go to just a little 1 megahertz canned oscillator. And my hypothesis was that this should work and that I should be able to transmit um, a weak signal at least to this radio sitting here, which I've pre-tuned. And now if I turn it on, I'll hold this up so you can hear it maybe a little better. Okay, that's not all that impressive, right? It sounds kind of warbly. And that's actually not completely unexpected. I thought Scott's idea was good as far as it went but it didn't necessarily have uh, quite all the I's dotted and T's crossed. For his mode, it probably does work well because the uh, Hellschreiber is a fairly narrow band method that has some inherent filtering in it. But um, to see what potentially goes on, I'm going to whiz over here to my little, uh, <coughs> excuse me, oscilloscope. We see that this is the pulse width modulated output that would normally be driving the laser output. So these things would be bright. And uh, this thing is, a horizontal division is about five microseconds. So each one of these little uh, pulses is somewhere around two microseconds. I think that, that the pulse width cycle time is about uh, something like uh, 46 kilohertz or 64 kilohertz, something like that. I worked it out before. But anyway, so this is the output that goes to feed the power input of the crystal oscillator. Now if I take my ever popular oscilloscope probe and I look at the output of it, this is what we see. And what you can see is that the um, amplitude of these things isn't smoothly varying. It's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's uh, basically just outputting a square wave at sort of two discrete. Um, let's see if I can zoom in even a little closer, maybe. It's perhaps not so obvious with all the blooming that this thing does, but basically there's about uh, 8 or 10 cycles inside each of these little square things, and they're either on or off. So it's basically just generating a really ratty square wave. So I think what you actually need to do to get this to work is to actually filter the, co the control voltage that goes to the modulating voltage that goes to the crystal oscillator. If the crystal oscillator tracks the same output voltage as, um, as you supply it, um, it should actually amplitude modulate and sound a lot better. So that's my hypothesis. I don't know whether it's really going to work out or not. Um, I'll have to test this over the next few days. Sadly, I went and had my eyes checked today and my pupils are still dilated, so I'm having trouble focusing on anything. So I doubt I'll get to it today. But thanks, Scott. Uh, if I make any headway on this, I will uh, post a subsequent video to let, let people know uh, how it worked out. It seems like kind of a cool idea to have a a transmitter circuit that could be used to send either LED modulated stuff, uh, laser modulated stuff, or in fact radio, which I think would be kind of cool. The other possibility is instead of just feeding power to the oscillator, I could actually make a little amplifier that would be switched, would use the output from the uh, from the pulse width modulation to actually uh, drive the output power uh, up and down, and uh, that would all that would probably just require an extra transistor and some some of the same sort of things that we've been doing in my amplifier posts. But anyway, it was kind of a neat idea. Thanks, Scott. And uh, someday I'll have this workbench cleaned up. What a mess! <laughs> but this has been Mark Van Wettering. Brainwave. Well, I wasn't going to work on this project anymore tonight, but I figured I'd give uh, a little bit of a try to understanding some of what was going on. The first thing I realized um, was that the length of the leads that connected the Arduino board that I had to my um, to the the board that contained the oscillator were really long, and that it was part of the signal I was hearing was actually harmonics of the original 
uh, pulse width modulation signal. So um, I shorten the leads up as much as I could and still get it on, you know, still be able to connect it without any too much difficulty. And that seemed to help a lot. Um, I also added a small input filter, uh, which I just sort of cobbled together, a little RC filter, to smooth out the waveform that's generated from the uh, pulse width modulation. It's actually not uh, quite good enough. Um, let's see if I can connect this up. Put my probe in here. And um, you can see that the waveforms are sort of, now sort of got this big um, underlying sine wave on them and they're bouncing up a little up and down but they're not getting a huge amount of modulation depth. So I'm going to have to figure out whether that's an intrinsic problem with the crystal oscillator, whether it's a problem with my filter. I'm not exactly 100% certain I understand exactly what's going on there. But uh, maybe uh, I need to actually even low pass filter the audio even more. But in any case, what I did was, uh, so that's pretty much the only changes I made. Shorten the leads, uh, put in an RC filter, and now when I power this on, oops, sorry. Rain wagon, rain wagon, rain wagon, rain wagon, rain wagon, rain wagon. So you can hear it going, rain wagon. And what's kind of interesting is I actually get a few close, turn this down. I get a few close signals that don't sound very good, so I'll tune those around. So here's one, and as I tune up slightly, so we're getting all sorts of copies, you know, all up and down this thing. So this thing is not pure at all. So, uh, of course, I'm just generating. Oh, let's look at the output. So, this is what's actually going to the antenna. Let's see if we can. So, you can see there's all of these. Let's up the time stuff a little bit. The waveform looks really wonky, kind of strange. Not 100% certain I know what's going on. But, uh,. It looks like it's still aliasing a lot, like the, like it's got some kind of slow superimposed signal on it. I don't know whether that's coming. That's undoubtedly the the uh, the sine wave that we saw on the input and the pulse wave modulation sort of showing up on the output, and then it's varying. So a lot of power is going into this slow sine wave. I'm not quite sure I know what's going on there. But anyway, that's as far as I've got. It does, at least in sort of in principle work, but um, right now it's not exactly what you'd call pure. So uh, I'm not going to leave this running <laughs> because uh, the FCC might come knocking even with this puny antenna. Um, there are all sorts of impedance matching things. I, this idea is just something that I realized I had most of the parts that I could just throw together on the bench. I really should sit down and think about it some more. But thanks again to Scott Harden for... Um, for making me think about this stuff. This has been Mark Van de Wettering of the Brainwagon blog.